It's that time of year when we talk about the state of the camera industry for the year 2022. We do this every year. We're going to go over every camera brand, tell you how they're performing, predict if we think they're in it for the long run. I think we can tell you which companies are going to survive and which are going to die off completely. All right. But first, I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. No matter what type of website you need, Squarespace can provide it for you. Just head to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Get your own private domain, your own spot on the web. You can sell your prints. You can take appointments from clients. You can show off your video. Whatever it is, Squarespace makes it possible. Start today, squarespace.com slash Chelsea. When you love it, the coupon code Chelsea gets you 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. First of all, let's start by talking about the crazy times we've obviously been living in. No kidding. Oh my gosh, the camera industry was already struggling from smartphone sales. They've been eating up that bottom market of point and shoot. And all of the camera companies were rearranging, trying to find their footing, trying to innovate and find where their sales were going to be. Bam, 2020. A whole pandemic oh. turns all of us upside down. There's labor shortages. And in 2021, things start to go back to normal. People want cameras, but you can't get them shipped or anything. But then 2022 comes this year and things start to return to normal. Kind of, except the used market is now super expensive because everyone's buying used cameras as well but things are a little more normal and I think things are looking more positive because camera sales are kind of stabilizing. Yeah, broadly in the industry, sales have returned to pre-2020 levels. The entire market has also stopped dropping. Like it's leveled off, which I was not sure was going to happen. I thought it might just keep dropping and dropping, but people stop trading their cameras in for smartphones. I think more people are using cameras because everyone became some kind of influencer or content creator during the pandemic. I think most of the population of the world opened up a YouTube photography channel in the last couple of years. So <laughs> yeah. they need, of course, they needed the cameras to do that. Yeah. Let's talk about the market share numbers, which have just recently been released. Now, these are end of 2021 market share numbers. So it's a point in time almost a year ago, but it's still the best data that we have. Okay, so let's talk about where it was in 2021. Canon had 45.8% of the market, had a huge wow. share. They're a giant. Sony is number two with 27% of the market. Nikon is number three with 11.3% of the market. Fujifilm is 5.9 and Panasonic is 4.4. And then the rest, they have a very small share of the market, so they're not in here. And that's like like a Hasselblad. Olympus, Olympus Pentax, they yeah. all share 5.6%. So there are some asterisks to these numbers. Like the Canon and Nikon market shares, those include DSLR sales, which they have both phased out their DSLR uh, markets, but those DSLR sales still make up for probably around half, if not more than half, of their overall sales. I think another thing to mention is that Fujifilm, these numbers include the Instax cameras. They're like Polaroids, instant yeah. film, point and shoot, not interchangeable lenses, but cool. And they have been selling like crazy, like every Gen Zer wants one of these. I also think it's interesting to see how these numbers changed from the previous year, to see who's gaining and who's losing market share. The only notable number is Sony has gained about 5%, going from 22% to 27%. And that is a, a huge, huge increase. Now, they are only selling mirrorless cameras at this point. So I think people just aren't buying as many DSLR cameras. They're buying more mirrorless cameras. And so, of course, Sony would get some of that market. But they stole that market from Canon and Nikon. Yeah, Canon went down about 2%. Nikon went down 2.5% about. But that's big. A, a drop from like almost 14% down to about 11%. We're going to go through each of these different camera companies, including Olympus, in order from smallest to biggest to sort of tell you how we think they're doing now and what we think their future is going to be. And I think that's important because it steers buying choices and it steers our recommendations because people who buy cameras now will want to stay within that system often for many decades. So you do have to kind of think about the future of these companies. I think it's really important too, because you see these companies go out of business, people can't get their cameras repaired the same way, or they're not innovating and they want to update their gear and then they have to change systems. So I do think that this is relevant and practical information. Let's start with Pentax. We've been calling them dead for five years now, probably. I'm but sure they love that. They did release a camera this year. It was an old camera. <laughs> they just sort of re-released it with a couple of minor modifications. Okay, some minor mods. But it's a good example of how a Japanese camera company sort of dies. 
in that they, they don't actually stop. Like if it was an American company, they would just say, oh, we're filing bankruptcy, everybody's laid off, we're done. But Japanese companies, they don't do it that way. They can't, they can't just lay people off in mass like that. So they just okay. sort of let people retire and they try to not lose as much money as they would otherwise. And they just very slowly just right off into the sunset. But you're not going to get any innovation from Pentax. They have an extremely loyal following, though. In fact, you're making me scared with all this dead talk because I don't feel like being emotionally attacked before the holidays, don't you? Pentax is so small at this point, I have not even been attacked by Pentax fanboys in years. Why are you inviting this hate and negativity into my life? Let's just move on to, wait, we can't end it like that. They have a very loyal following. I think they're going to continue to stay around. I don't imagine huge innovations are going to come out. I don't think they're going to be gaining market share, but I do think they're going to be trying to hold their market share and their employees and their fans. And direct the hate at Tony. I'm the nice one. Okay, let's talk about OM systems. I'm sure this won't generate any hate at all. This is what became of Olympus cameras when they exited the camera industry. And they were acquired by JIP. They did release a couple of cameras this past year, like the OM-1. And a lot of people really like the OM-1. They worked on what other people are working on, things like the frame rate and the subject identification, and people were happy with the results. But what I don't see is anybody selling their Canons or Nikons or Sonys and switching to OM. What I see are them making cameras that they can sell to their existing fan base, which is a good formula for continuing to make money because people are, there are fanboys, they are enthusiastic for the brand and they are locked into a system. Like they have a proprietary lens mount like all these other camera manufacturers. So it's not so easy to switch to Canon or Sony. You'd have to go in and sell everything and learn a whole new system. Yeah. And so I think there is a, a reasonable business model there to continue making something that's maybe not good enough to make people switch, but good enough to make existing users upgrade. Yeah, and I think they have their own little niche that people appreciate, and I do understand that. Some of my favorite cameras are not the best or the most techno technologically advanced cameras, but I enjoy using them, and so I think Olympus people will stay within their system, even if they're not having any huge advancements in technology. But I do hear from these people. They're like, I, I bought the Olympus system because they had the best this or the best that, and that's not the case anymore. They are definitely being out innovated by the likes of Canon and Sony. Yeah, well, Canon and Sony have a huge budget for developing new technology. So of course that makes sense. So when you buy into these companies uh, that aren't as profitable, then you're probably not gonna get as much money put into developing new tech. I do think we'll see other camera releases from OM systems. I think each one will, carry some amount of disappointment with it. We'll probably continue to see mostly software-based improvements, something that probably could have been a firmware update, but they decided to release it as a new camera body and drive some upgrades and drive some additional profit. We'll probably won't ever see any big innovations. I hope they just do something. It doesn't have to be expensive to be fun and cool, though. Yeah, we'll talk about Fuji soon because that really is where they excel. But first, I want to talk about Panasonic. And Panasonic, from the beginning carved out a really smart niche, which is video. Like their first GH1, uh, we had GH2s and GH3s in the first iteration of this studio many years ago. Before anybody else was really thinking about video, Panasonic was all about it. And that market has grown to be really bigger than the still market now is there are so many people creating their own content who want something better than a smartphone. Yeah, and I think another thing that Panasonic continues to do really well is that they serve their audience well. They're not innovating their video cameras in the way some of the bigger companies are, like Canon and Sony have phase detect autofocus in their video cameras. They still don't have phase detect autofocus, but their audience often likes to manually focus. They're more like film nerds, and I mean that in a very endearing and loving way. They want more control over the video. They don't want everything to be automatic for them. So they're staying loyal to Panasonic. Uh, I do think that means they're missing out on the audience that just wants to set it up, leave it, have everything focused on when they're, you know, doing a YouTube video and they want you to focus on the product. But they're hanging on to their audience because I think they served them well. Recently, their CEO announced that they would be focusing on video cameras. And the statement was a little ambiguous and it was in Japanese, but I do take it to mean that they probably won't be trying to out 
Sony A1 or out Canon R5. They're not going to be producing super high stills frame rates and super high megapixel cameras in that way. They'll probably focus on video capabilities and that I think is the right choice. That makes total sense to me. Yeah, I think that makes sense too. They probably won't be in the megapixel wars or anything like that, but they don't need to be because I don't think that's what their audience wants. I think the bigger decision point is going to be Panasonic L mount, the full frame L mount that was introduced in 2018 to compete with Nikon and Canon full frame mirrorless or their Micro Four Thirds system. Now, this year we reviewed the Panasonic GH6, a Micro Four Thirds camera, and it was fantastic. Like I would have switched to it for a video in a second except for one thing. The phase detect. The autofocus yeah, the was auto. just unreliable and it just killed a couple of shots for me and so I just sent it back and haven't tried to pick it up since. We're nerds, but we're not that kind of nerd. We're lazy nerds. Well, we don't have a dedicated cameraman all the time. So, no. but that applies to just about everybody in our segment. And there are millions and millions of people. Most video buyers want autofocus at least some of the time. Yeah. So in the past, I have been concerned about the viability of Panasonic Lumix cameras because some statements by the CEO indicated that they might be cutting unprofitable divisions and I wasn't sure. I'm still not 100% sure either way, but my inclination at this point is to say that Lumix is going to continue making cameras, but I will probably only be recommending them to people who are manual focus video first and maybe stills second, um, especially because of the kind of limited lens selection. And I'll be steering them towards full frame L mount as opposed to micro four thirds. Fuji film. This is, you know that I'm a Fuji fan because I have my X100V. Yeah. I think this is another brand that does a really excellent job at carving out a niche, finding their audience, giving them what them, they want, and being unique enough to set themselves apart. Of course, they have like the medium format cameras like the GFX. People are really thrilled about those, but I'm wondering where they're going to go with that. I'm wondering if they're going to continue to innovate that. What do you think about that? I don't think GFX is going to have a lot of innovations in the future. First, they're reliant on Sony to make these medium format sensors. So it, maybe Sony will make a 200 megapixel sensor, or maybe they'll make a stacked CMOS sensor that can be really fast and provide for good autofocus, but I would bet that probably won't happen. We'll probably never see high frame rate or fast autofocus capabilities like we do out of the best full frame cameras. Now, that 100 megapixel sensor continues to be amazing and capable of producing fantastic results for, you know, landscape, commercial, product, photography, sort of small niches, but it's never going to be a good hybrid camera for video. Never. But it is niche. And that's exactly our point with Fuji. They do niche well. Mm -hmm. So like maybe it's not practical for every application, but Fuji film shooters seem to understand that Fuji cameras aren't good at everything. Yeah. I have an X-Pro3 that I love because it's interchangeable camera and it is a rangefinder format with an optical viewfinder and minimalist controls. And there's no other camera that's like that. And if you look at the X-T series, like the new X-T5, all analog controls. And Nikon tried to copy it with the ZFC. Sony kind of tried to do it with the A7C, but neither one of them got it right. Fuji gets it right. Fuji understands that photography can be tactile and fun. And people can love the experience of it, that it does not have to be about the results. Yeah, I like the soul of the camera, yeah. but don't use it for my like professional work. Right, well, we've just been testing the X-H2, their brand new camera that bragged about the best autofocus, but in my testing, it still does not compete with the best cameras from Sony and Canon. And if I was shooting sports or even portraits where I really care about the accuracy, I'd still be steering people to those two full frame mounts and away from Fuji. Unless they said, I'm a hobbyist and I just think cameras are cool. Then I'd be like, you go get yourself an X-Pro, you go get yourself an X-T, like that's cool, that's fun. Fuji has fallen down in a couple of ways. Like they had this Kaizen philosophy where they were releasing free software updates all the time. I think the first Fuji X-T1 had, uh, I don't know, like three major software updates that just fixed almost every problem with it. Like they listened so carefully and solved every single thing they could. We're not seeing that for current Fuji cameras. Nowadays, if you want even just software updates, you have to upgrade to the next model. You actually have to pay for it. And I feel like they changed philosophy from building long-term brand loyalty to sort of cashing in on their customer base. 
I think that's okay if that's what they need to do to survive. I, well, it's probably the only path for them. But I'm just not seeing new exciting lenses like we are seeing from Canon and Nikon and Sony. It's just, there's just not the innovation there that they used to be. Fuji used to be the tech leader, and I don't think you can say that anymore. Now Fuji is the fun leader. They're the experience leader. But I think that's a totally viable business model, and that we don't have detailed financials. I think that my hunch is that they're totally viable, and if you seem like a Fuji person, then you can buy it and not worry that it's not going to be around in a couple of years. I think there'll be an X-H3 and an X-T6. Yeah, I would totally buy into Fuji, especially because people think that we have a favorite brand and really we just want all of the brands to survive because then there's diversity, we get different cameras, we get competition, we get more interesting stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And so I love that Fuji has all these niches and that they're making things that are a little bit different. It's, it's cool. If you want something a little bit different, you can make your very own Squarespace website or portfolio store, gallery. I have all of those things. I have a client's page where I can send my clients and they can see their pictures without having to download them. Sometimes people struggle with that. You can sell your prints and even collect the money and have Squarespace do all the back end stuff in your shop. And it's super simple. Just drag and drop your photos in, make a few different pages. I love it. I have multiple Squarespaces. You're going to love it too. I promise. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. You get a free trial. You don't have to enter a credit card and remember to cancel. There is nothing to lose. When you decide to buy it, and I know you will, use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. Thanks. Now's the right time for a Squarespace because it is the right time to flee social media. Like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, they are all falling apart. You need some other home on the web. You need your own spot. Well, it's not just about that. It's about having a professional place to land. I check out every single restaurant contractor. Someone's coming to fix our appliances. I'm shopping somewhere. I check their website to make sure they're up to date, that they are tech savvy enough to actually make a website mm -hmm. and want to be present and professional. And so it really speaks for your brand to have a place where people can go and see your work and your contact information and a little bit about you. We're gonna talk about Nikon, Canon, and Sony now, the big three. Okay. And we're doing this in order of market share, so the next up is Nikon with 11% of market share. Yeah, I've been impressed with Nikon. I know that they have kind of fallen from number one or two to number three, and they struggled a little bit, but they are hanging on. They came out with the Z9. People love it. Mm -hmm. I was not hot on it when it first came out, to be honest, I was gentle about it at the time. I didn't like it at all. But they've had a few firmware updates and every time it gets better. And so I see Nikon really hanging in there and trying to compete with these flagship cameras from Sony and Canon. And I'm rooting for them. I'm rooting for them too. I The Z9, the firmware updates have been impressive. They have come up with some really cool novel features. There are things that Z9 can do that I cannot do with my other cameras. And there are reasons I would pick it or recommend it over Canon and Sony, and that is really their goal. They're carving out unique capabilities. At the same time, I think Canon and Sony will probably rip them off in their next iterations. I hope so, because I want that predictive. Yeah. What's that feature called? Pre-capture? Pre-capture. You press the shutter and then it captures things from like a second ago. So if you're doing wildlife photography, you get the action shot. It's so cool. People are going to be mad if I don't point out that Olympus and Panasonic did that years ago. Okay. <laughs> but, but still, we want that tech to trickle through the entire industry. Now, some people are mad that those other cameras like the Z6 and Z7 haven't gotten those same firmware updates that Nikon has given out to the Z9. It's clear Nikon is focusing on their flagship camera because that represents the entire brand. People look at the performance of the top tier camera, assess the entire system, and then they buy in at the bottom. But they want to know who the tech leader is. And Nikon is the tech leader in some ways, just not in the key ways that all these Japanese companies have convinced us are the most important things like the subject detection and autofocus tracking. They're, they're still behind there. But nobody is accelerating faster than Nikon. One thing that makes me really hopeful, I know that they've had some layoffs and things like that that were really making me concerned, but something that makes me hopeful is that they have more time than I thought. And I'm really thankful that Loyalist 
give the camera companies a little more time to catch up and people are so they've had a few years like i said the firmware updates are trickling out with the z9 and people are patient and hopeful and optimistic and i love that so i think nikon's going to have more time to innovate and i hope catch up or at least just keep that foothold in the market at number three stay steady and uh, plateau and because the whole market in general is plateauing and stabilizing i think that's even more possible for them they are profitable in 2022 and i think that means they'll be profitable in 2023 and probably going forward in 2021 we were very concerned that they couldn't ship anything but the z9 a year old now is finally in stock you can just go buy a z9 and that applies to lots of the lenses that were out of stock like nikon is catching up do you think they will ever catch up and surpass Canon or Sony. I would love to see them innovate something that is the next thing and have them catch up. And I mean that because competition just means we get better cameras, we get cooler tech, they have to fight it out, they have to earn our dollars, that is good for us. So I would love to see that. Do I think that's gonna happen? I don't know. I, I think that's some long odds that I would like to see happen. What do you think? I think it could be tough given their smaller market share and all the layoffs they've done and the just the crazy pace that Sony and Canon are going at. I think it's going to be tough for them to catch up. So I think they might end up carving out different niches for themselves. They're going to poach some engineers. Come on, Nikon, let's get ruthless. Poach them. Dirty. Let's do some espionage. <laughs> I also say what I've heard is 85 to 95% of new camera buyers are also shopping for video capabilities, either as their primary concern or a secondary concern to stills. And Nikon is behind in this segment based on my testing. Like I tried to do some video with the Z9 when we went up to Maine and it failed me miserably. It was a very frustrating experience to the point where I just stopped using it for video. Nikon has been behind in video. They're the only one of these three companies that does not have dedicated cinema cameras. We need them to do some leaps at this point, but we believe, and we know you believe too. How about Sony? Number two in market share, but the only one that is increasing their market share. They're stealing everybody else's business and th their acceleration is crazy. We know Sony makes good cameras. Like they released the A7R5 this year. I think the A7R4 was this year. Those were both great. Um, they are releasing lots of niche cameras for video creators like the ZV-E10 that I just see recommended constantly for those markets because it's stable, reliable, capable. But they're also looking even farther forward. They're the only one of these camera companies who has their own smartphone division, the Xperia series cameras, which integrate tightly with their alpha cameras, giving them capabilities that the other manufacturers cannot offer. Yeah. They're the only company that has drones. They have the AirPeak drone. It's the first one and it's real expensive. It's really expensive, but it's good. I like that they're going for a higher end market. I like that they're going for extremely high quality because then that gives me faith that it could trickle down to a, cons a more affordable consumer market rather than coming in with some flaky toy that doesn't work. Yeah, I think five, 10 years from now, that'll be a key differentiator. You will be buying Sony cameras because you can make them flying cameras by attaching it to a fairly inexpensive drone. They're also the only company out of all of these that has an active TikTok presence. Don't laugh. I know that seems silly. Yeah. You got y'all used to laugh about Instagram, remember? Mm -hmm. And then everyone was on Instagram. So stop it. Stop laughing at new things. TikTok is where it's at. They're tapping into the younger market, the next generation. They're locking in their customers young to grow with them. And they're looking to get ahead of the technology by talking to these young people. It's a smart strategy. People need to be looking out for Sony for sure. Yeah, we don't just assess where they are today, but where they are going in the future. And I think Sony has the smartest direction. Sony is like a mastermind. They scare me a little bit because when we say something unflattering about another company, they don't talk to us. It's like we get the cold shoulder, you know, they're, they're mad at us. They take it personally or something. Sony will just be like, tell me then, what do you want from me? Look at it. They'll get a free consultation out of you. That's what Sony does. And then yeah. they do it. Yeah, two and years then, later, we'll see it. It'll take a little bit. Yeah, so we'll trash them one year. And then two years later, they have us singing praise because they give us everything they want for it. But it's not just us. They do this with their customers. And um, they must have extremely good high-level management because I think it takes a lot of trust. And I think it takes a really stable person in a high-level management to allow that kind of constructive criticism to take place. 
So I'm like extremely impressed with Sony. I feel totally comfortable recommending them for just about anything. Stills, video, sports, portraits, landscapes. You know, they make their own sensors like Canon and they're really well positioned. So let's talk about the number one camera manufacturer. Almost it's half Canon. the market. Canon. They're unbelievable. They've just been holding firm at number one forever. But we had serious concerns about them. Like in the era of the 5D Mark IV, that camera was kind of a flop. We were really disappointed in it. And they were falling behind Sony at that point. Oh my gosh, do you remember their first mirrorless cameras? The first mirrorless cameras were bad. We they tried to bad. put a 500 F4 on them and I just think that's got us not talked to for a long time because that autofocusing system was horrible with the long lens. Right. But then they released the Canon R5. It, I did not expect it to be that good. Which still is an amazing camera, even though it hasn't so received good. big updates. Like, it blew us away. That was the first camera we felt like and people should go mirrorless. Like, go ahead and trade in your DSLRs. This camera is completely capable. We used it as our main camera for everything for years. Canon, whenever I start to think that they're falling behind, they do this thing where they leapfrog. Mm -hmm. And so those first mirrorless, they really were a stinker. I don't know why people were so mad at us about that. I would never recommend those, but now their new mirrorless are amazing. I think they have a lot of promise too. In 2023, we're looking at the release of the Canon R5 Mark II. Yeah. Several less expensive cameras like a Canon R8 and I think a Canon R50. So they should get to that like $600 price point with their same amazing mirrorless camera capabilities. And I, I cannot imagine what the Canon R1, they're finally going to release their flagship end of 2023, maybe 2024. Their video capabilities are also good, very good. Yeah, they have excellent cinema cameras. So they're totally in both the still and video market. And I, I don't think you can go wrong with Canon or Sony. They're both just excellent companies. My only thing is I think they're a little boring. Like I love that the Z9 came up with some cool technology to put in there. I think Sony often tries new interesting things. Mm -hmm. um, Canon does have some cool stuff, but I feel like they wait a little bit. They, they have been more aggressive lately. Like the R3 had that eye tracking feature. Oh, that's true. They have been throwing little things in there. That's now, true, it, didn't, it did not work well, but they did try it. If you had to recommend a camera to someone, would it be buying into the Canon system or the Sony system or something else? I think it's six of one and half a dozen of the other. Like, I'm totally, like, they're, they're almost the same. Yeah. Wildlife, portraits, sports, landscapes, like, you're not, you're, you're never really gonna see any difference. One year Sony might be ahead in one market and Canon behind it, but then the next year Canon's gonna leapfrog them. It's gonna be a wash, I think. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good assessment. I think I might divide it up like Sony, I think, thinks of a younger, more tech-savvy market. Mm. And so I think that I typically tend to recommend Sony to younger people or tech enthusiasts. Yeah, this makes or sense. Canon is like really stable and reliable to me. It's like a minivan. You know, when you get that friend and they have kids and they get the minivan, they're like, and you can pull up the seats and you can fit in the stroller and you can talk to the kids and you can reconfigure the seats. And it's like, it does everything you want. It's just not extremely sexy or exciting. Whereas Sony, I think, is like a little more fun in some ways. Good that's, summary. That's my personal assessment. What is yours? What did we get wrong? Um, what attacking mean things to the Pentax people want to call Tony specifically, we want to know. Yeah, go wake up a Pentax user and no. tell them how YouTube works. See if they have an internet connection. Why are you continuing to dig us into this hole? <laughs> I don't like it. And thank you guys for watching uh, the Picture This Photography podcast. We also do an audio podcast, so you can get it anywhere where you listen to your podcasts. Um, Thanks for listening and thank you Squarespace for making this podcast possible. If you want your very own Squarespace website, it's super easy to do. Just go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. If you like it, use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. Thank you Squarespace. Bye.